Hi all, thank you so much for joining. This is Oceanic Global's offering for Earth Week, Ancient Wisdom and the Ocean. My name is Cassia Patel. I'm the program director of Oceanic Global, which is a ocean conservation nonprofit focused on inspiring others to care deeply about the ocean. And we provide tools for people to take action to promote ocean conservation around the world. Our focus is also really on behavior change. And with that, we work in two pillars of action, one at the individual grassroots community level, through which we have a hubs program, where we actually have a volunteer-based chapters in New York, LA, London, Barcelona, and that is growing around the world. So if you're in any of those regions, please do reach out to get involved. And our hubs focus on youth education and empowerment, policy reform, supporting policies and legislations to ban single-use plastics and promote ocean health more broadly, and then also focusing on awareness and action activities beyond that, and really offering tools for people to become leaders in their own community, to start this dialogue and to find solutions that make sense within a local context. And on the industry side, working directly with businesses to help them primarily eliminate single-use plastics and improve waste management, seeing that as a gateway to then start talking about food procurement, water, energy conservation, emissions, and beyond. And throughout everything, really focusing on awareness and engagement, bringing new audiences into the conversation about ocean conservation. And with that, our focus for Earth Week this year is to of course talk about the ocean within the context of our broader planetary system as Sylvia Earle says with no no blue no green if we don't have a functioning and healthy ocean we don't have a functioning and healthy planet the two are so interconnected land and sea and that's something that we fundamentally believe and and view and beyond that to think about the existing and ancient wisdom that has been guiding our path towards finding harmony and balance with our natural systems. I'm going to start today by honoring and acknowledging the known ancestors of the land that Oceanic Global's headquarters is on, which is currently known as New York City, um, but historically is the Lenape Hoking, the land of the Lenape. And we are currently working with First Peoples in the region to better understand the history of the land and to form a long-term and living understanding of that history and acknowledgement and respect of the land with our work in the future. And we absolutely encourage others to investigate the history of the land that you're on, to understand the history of the stewardship of those that have come before and of those that are still actually on this land as well, as well as to work with First Peoples in your community in that dialogue and in that journey, uh, which is one that we're very excited to be on, thinking of this as a very long-term relationship building for the future. I also want to take a moment now to give thanks to our partner Aspiration, which is a new kind of financial partner that puts people and planet first. Aspiration does not invest in fossil fuels and plants a tree for every customer's purchase. They're also using ocean plastic to create their new card and they offer 10% cash back for a socially conscious purchase. All of this is aligned with Oceana Global ethos and views and we really encourage you to explore and check out their work if you register for an account via aspirations.com backslash oceans that will actually contribute $25 in donation to Oceanic Global which will cover the production costs and speaker honorariums for this very event Today, we will be hearing from community leaders and storytellers from around the world and fostering dialogue on the theme ancient wisdom and the ocean for Earth Week this year, we thought it was important to recognize and honor the role that traditional indigenous and local knowledge plays in ocean conservation and beyond. While there are many exciting technological innovations in research methodologies and scientific innovation and discovery, we know that these approaches will be all the more powerful when informed by this ancient wisdom from elders and communities who have stewarded the land and sea for generations. There are existing stories of hope, of what it looks like to achieve balance with our natural surroundings and to recognize that we are a part of nature and not separate. There are existing tools, and we'll be hearing about many of these from our speakers throughout the day, 
tools and resources that can help inform the work we are doing and to emulate these approaches in communities around the world. Fundamentally, for all who have experienced climate grief or eco-anxiety, from what we're hearing today, we'll learn that we have all of the tools and all of the knowledge that we need here within us right now to address environmental issues, to address socioeconomic issues, to address racism, to address fear. When we come from a heart center and loving, compassionate approach, we can see that all of these issues are interconnected and intersectional and do require a holistic approach. And on that note, I'm excited to learn with you today from all of these elders and experts, mothers and fathers who are sharing their insight and that we can be integrating into the work that we're doing, whatever field you're coming from. I encourage you all to listen with an open heart and an open mind and throughout the day to think about how you can integrate this into the work that you're already doing or living in your daily practice. A huge thank you to all of our speakers, facilitators, partners, and team members, without which none of this would be possible. This has been an absolute labor of love, and already it's been a long learning process, and we see this as the beginning of a lo much longer term journey and learning process into the future. So thank you all for being a part of this. We are so excited to be celebrating this moment with you. On that note, it is now my pleasure to introduce our host for the day, Natalie Kelly, who is an actress and an activist with Indigenous Peruvian heritage, she has long used her platform to highlight indigenous wisdom and environmental causes, including soil health and regenerative agriculture. And we are thrilled that she is joining us on this ocean journey. She has recently become an Oceanic Global Ambassador, and it has been an absolute pleasure to work with her. The passion and the dedication that she brings and that she shows up with is inspiring. And we've been learning from every conversation with her. Nat, over to you. Today's event ancient wisdom and the ocean recognizes the ocean as the source and sustainer of all life on earth. And that's why today we want to honor the people, wisdom and traditions that have preserved its health for generations. The programming today will focus on the role of traditional, indigenous and local knowledge in ocean conservation and the importance of incorporating that knowledge hand in hand with conventional science so that we can find long-term solutions for a truly sustainable future. Throughout the day, we will be hosting four discussion circles around the key themes of protecting our marine areas, fisheries, climate resiliency, and oceanic biodiversity. So a little bit about the flow for today. We're gonna kick the day off with a series of keynotes from storytellers and community leaders from around the world with some moments of ceremony and performance mixed in. Then afterwards, we'll break out into discussion circles where we'll have the chance to hear from and speak with some of our keynote speakers and additional subject matter experts on the topics of biodiversity, climate resiliency, fisheries, and protecting marine areas. The discussion circles will be live conversations co-facilitated by representatives from Oceanic Global and today's partners. Then afterwards, we will regroup after the discussion circles to hear key insights from our facilitators before heading into our final performance and closing remarks. As we talk about ancient wisdom in the ocean, we wanted to start the day by grounding ourselves in a celebration of and recognition of the element of water. You know, water is the first element that we as humans come into contact with in the womb of our mothers as amniotic fluid. And we are actually 70% water, which is the same amount of the earth that is covered in water as well. So there is an intimate connection here with this element that is often overlooked, which is why we wanted to take this moment to really celebrate the role of water in our lives. Ayandi, Nandi, Biskungui, Zakinokwani, Ebadi, Amy, Woman, a Kanasa Nandi, Kwabani, Ebed Nandi, Wintuqua, Chikaintana, Nabi, Ebed Nibs and Kanisiba Badi, Emma. Nibizakuna Nuga, Nibitakuna Nuga, Nekar Chowan Kachoka, Tranaka Gunigeri, 
a Masai, a Zmezare, King Kai, a Mina Azad Nakanokin, a Tina, a Nibizrumak, Nibitin, and Nenang, and Kamasaya for a thousand Kajakwazan, Nifkani Koyaname, Ibari, a me Nabi. But Nibi Zedi, Nibi O Mangwasi, and that Sisangwasi, Jibu the Nekanak Nanand, Nibkin Kansas and Nibingwasi, Bing Nekanang Mizakse and Zadi Zinogeka, and Chungo Kumangari Asa with the Nibetabian and the Kabasian. And the Aibame then Nibi Zedi, Nibi Nibtak, and Kizanazan de Makuriba. A very Nothing causing Okumaja and Gurun. Yandi Nibitak Nandiari Nibitrumak Kazara Demon Chundwa Ima Jeng Nikari Jeng Chunuga, a Masindi, Ingbian Knanja, Nibitaku, Nibitrumak, Vinan Knanjas and Kavazan Evame Nibidi A King, the Narizan, a party on the Sarpa. In Fari, the Nekandi, Kurigan, Kurigan, your Sidigan, and Kazakhan as a Nekand, Nibtaku, Nibitrumakari, Ink Binakins and Kabarumak Majas and Nekazan. Wow. Nere, a Kinsan. We will now hear from community leader and storyteller Anofo Havea sharing stories of hope from on the ground. Anofo is the founder of the Tonga Voyaging Society. She is a pioneer as the first female licensed captain in Tonga and Polynesia. She captains yachts and vakas, which are traditional Polynesian canoes. She has been bringing traditional navigation and voyaging back to her community while at the same time empowering other women to take on such leadership positions. She's building an eco-tourism whale watching movement to work in harmony with aquatic ecosystems and to protect marine life. Anofo hopes that she can inspire others through her passion for the health of the oceans, eco-tourism and sustainable sea transport. Malonile everyone, my name is Anofo uh, and I am from uh, the beautiful island of uh, Vavau, uh, Kingdom of Tonga, South Pacific. And I am um, a mother of uh, five kids. Um, been working on the oceans um, more than 26 years. And I have a lot of questions about our oceans and our heritage and culture as well, uh, traditional navigations. Also, I'm uh, the president of uh, Tonga Waiting Society in Tonga and uh, working along uh, together with the youth and community, community here in, in Tonga, and uh, as well a uh, captain and, and a voyager. Ancient wisdom and oceans. In the beginning, there was oceans. This is how most stories of origin start in, in the Pacific. Where there is talk about the ocean, we talk about how much she is like a mother to us. 
She nurtures us with abundance of providings which feeds our bodies and soul. She leads us with her way of showing what is affecting her and how just like she takes care of us. We should also take care of her. She can also be quite daunting when she knows as how much of a force of a nature she can be. By being a catalyst of cyclones, by holding just a vast a vastness, by sharing such power of what can be utilized in renewable energy and sustainability and breath life into us. With all the ocean provides for us in this earth, it is only right that we take up the role of being guardians, a good steward of the oceans. And that's we exceed expectations of this role. We are dodging in our school and through our chance of our nomadics and chester. Then apply the background of why our ancestors voyage and navigating this vast space of the oceans and how they accomplished such daring feats our ancestors in their pursuing of fishing up islands and collaborating this distance stars they settle and then adapt with their new found environment they live sustainably on this island knowing the value of the resources and maintaining a holistic way of life the ancient wisdom which is passed through times is considered highly available in our everyday life. We practice it in the lecture of how it was passed on to us. Through the language we speak, the customary clothes we wear, the chants we use during ceremonies, the handicraft we practice, the sustainable way we farm and land and in the oceans. Oceans ancestors share the knowledge on how they arrived to this island with a canoe. In Tonga, we call it Kalia. The Kalia and Bodhis people relationship with the environment. The Vaka bring things to life. It is, it is catalyst with activities people since the relations of the Vaka across the Pacific. We have learned more about ourselves, our culture, than we ever have learned before. The Vaka has brought us closer in making us more aware of what we need and what is required of us in preserving not only our culture, but our heritage too. There is this unreading understanding among the islands, despite the vastness of the oceans. She does not divide us, but she connected us. The clear with the ancient mana act like a needle and thread in bringing us all together. The ancient knowledge we were gifted within our heirloom that we must try to continue in keeping it legacy that it is. And with most story we end it with, how life is returned to the oceans. O la tuwe, o la tuwe, pe itonga mai mua, kau toke lau, ia, ia, leve leve malanga kau tawat. Malo opito. Up next, we will hear from the Mundas people in the coastal Sundarban region of Bangladesh as they share a story about rising sea levels and climate impacts. Sanjeev Drong, the General Secretary of the Bangladesh Indigenous Peoples Forum, will join us later today in the discussion circle.
बाली रानी मुंडा हमारे बाप दादा मन दूसरों को सर आगे आलाय हैं आए के जंगल बॉन जंगल काट के साफ करके ऐसो जगह बसा और के रात रात शिकार हनी कोनो उभाब नहीं रहे आगे का शाल खगरा पात रहे बड़ो वो खगरा आगे मुतन खगरा था मोटे बाल नहीं रहे आगे इरों घुन्नी झोड़ पात रहे बुन्ना पात रहे ता हनी के ती डार नहीं लगा दरे आरे ऐखान ऐखान बेशी डार ऐखान घनो घनो होइला बसोरे दो तीन बार भी भी होइला हनी के लिए ये बॉन्ड टक हनी हंदोर कोविस्तोर हनी मोने के लिए आर हमने आदिवासी मन विश्वास के सिन्ने हिना हनी मावनों भी भी केर नाम के लिए हनी बोने आवीला आरो मावनों भी को पूजा दिए ला हनी आर ये खान बोनो आमन केर कोनो है ना क्या शॉप बांगली मान तो ले देना है अन्य अगर आदिवासी मान कोनो किसने नहीं बुझा दे अन्य घुमड़ारी घुमड़ारी ये भावे केर कहाँ पे ठप्प ठप्प ले लो आता है वो वो गास रहे काटे नहीं तो आता है बाप दादा मन कुछ दिन से ये गास का साल ना काट रहा झोड़ा ले बन्ना ले निकाल दे के पास ले यहाँ के काटे नहीं तो आ पानी आ गई ना पानी आए के पाला पाली हुई ना फिर काबर उगे भारे शुरू दूर पानी आवर गे भारे आज खान झोर तोड़ हुई ना पानी तानी आ गई ना खूब जोर आग शेष में पानी बिद्दी हो तो ये पानी बिद्दी में ला रास्ता उपर ला छपाए के हनी घर दिखा रहे Bangladesh government has recognized 50 indigenous communities. Among them, the Mundas are the most vulnerable and marginalized. Indigenous peoples have spiritual relationship with nature, ocean, rivers, and environment. The very survival and way of life of Munda people depend on the ocean. The Sundarban mangrove forest and the ocean must be protected clean and safe. Government should adopt a special policy for the ocean and indigenous peoples in Bangladesh. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce my friend and personal hero, Alaska's Dune Lankard, an Iyak Athabascan native of the Eagle Clan. Dune has founded and co-founded several key organizations, including the Iyak Preservation Council, and Native Conservancy. His tireless strategies have helped win the preservation of more than 1 million acres of wild salmon habitat in the Exxon Valdez spill zone. Dune has received wide recognition for his leadership, including as one of Time Magazine's Top 50 Heroes for the Planet, Prime Movers Award, and fellowships with the Ashoka Foundation and Future of Fish. Dune is now venturing into kelp farming in the Prince William Sound for restoration, growing traditional food sources, and for building regenerative economies and resiliency for our ocean and coastal communities. His talk is titled Kelp and Coal. It will be in the discussion circle later today of climate resiliency. Dune will be sharing more about his work to build community and to drive action for climate resiliency. Uh, my name is Dune Lankard. I'm an Eak Athabascan Indian from the Copper River Delta in Prince William Sound in Alaska. And my Eak name is Jamutsuki. Uh, that means little bird that screams really loud and won't shut up. And I was given that name shortly after the Exxon Valdez oil spill happened in my backyard. Um, Otherwise, no one would probably know my name right now. Um, <clears throat> my uh, clan is Eagle Clan. Uh, we have the eagles and the ravens. And at one time, we had 
uh, the wolf and the bear clans, much like the Clinket Athabascan people. Uh, we originally had come out of the interior of Alaska uh, 3,500 years ago and came across the glaciers down to the coastline in the Gulf of Alaska. And we landed in this place uh, called Yakutat, which one of the Eak uh, names um, for Yakutat or meanings is uh, where the canoes rest or the lagoon behind the sea. And uh, there we encountered uh, other uh, warring tribes, the Chugash Eskimos and the Aleut, and the Clinket came to our rescue in exchange for uh, helping our EAC people because we are both of Athabascan descent. Uh, we had to give up our women. And so in exchange um, for protection, uh, we have had to give up some powerful, amazing EAC women. And we got tired of that, so we fled across the Delta 300 miles to what is now known as Cordova, uh, where we live now. And we figured we'd start camping there till it quit raining, and that was 3,500 years ago. And that's who I am. The um, The world that we're in right now uh, is a time of uh, a global pandemic of uh, climate change beyond belief and civil unrest. And <clears throat> what happens when moments like that happen in time, our leaders seem to lose their wisdom and make decisions that aren't in the best interest of the planet or the people. And so much like when the Exxon Valdez oil spill happened in our backyard, uh, everyone uh, lost their minds. They, they lost their wisdom. Uh, they wanted to develop everything they possibly could in order for us to continue to survive. At the time that um, the prices of salmon were plummeting, the values of our fishing permits plummeted, the values of our boats uh, went down, uh, people were struggling socially. Uh, there was uh, drug and alcohol abuse, there was divorces, there was fishing partnerships breaking apart that were together for 15, 20, 25 years or more. Uh, there was a lot of duress. And this was at the time that Exxon was telling us that, you know, we're Exxon, we do it right. We're going to make you whole again. In the meantime, they had um, actually appealed the verdict that we won in 1994 uh, of $5 billion. They appealed that 17 times until they got the Supremes of their dreams to take the case not to set a precedent or to make sure that justice was served, but to make sure that just us was served. And what that meant for us was that we are on our own. And so all these development projects started happening. Uh, we took on, we, our EAC Preservation Council took on 37 major environmental battles. And thank God we won 35 of those. We filed dozens of lawsuits, did everything we possibly could to keep our place wild and roadless and pristine. And in the meantime, uh, as, as everything was, was starting to fall around us, or, or at least uh, people wanted to figure out how they were going to diversify the lost economy of fishing, with all of this other development, there was this idea to build a road across the Copper River Delta, a 55 mile road. And so Don Young, the Alaska Congressman, uh, introduced what he called the Chugash Road Rider. And it was gonna be a 55 mile road being built across pristine wilderness of the Copper River Delta, uh, 500 feet wide, five times federal standard, uh, no environmental impact statements, no environmental assessments, no restoration bonds, 
uh, it would have destroyed the Delta. It would have been a slow moving oil spill across the Copper River Delta. And so we went out and, <clears throat> and arrested this first bridge that they wanted to build across Clear Creek. And, and I realized at that moment that if this road was ever built, there would be a deep water port built in Cordova, a port of extraction, turning Cordova into a port city. They would build this 55 mile road across the Delta. And what it would do is it would then open up clear cutting, more clear cutting, strip mining uh, for coal and other minerals. Uh, there was planned oil and gas drilling onshore and offshore. Uh, and it would have linked up a lot of other development projects. And so to me at that moment in time, I realized that we had to do everything in our power if we were going to keep this place somewhat pristine and a home for the salmon to come home to, that we had to keep the coal in the ground. We had to figure out how to keep the coal in the ground. And this was a, a tall order because in, Every other place, um, you know, uh, they've been able to figure out how to uh, mine the wealth uh, right out of the villages and the communities and, and take our way of life from us. Alaska historically has been a natural resource extraction state. And so when I, you look back in the history of territorial days through statehood, uh, when they founded oil, the reason there was a land claim settlement for the Indian people, because there was an Indian problem. How did they get to the oil without settling the land claims for the native peoples? And so uh, the oil companies uh, and the uh, federal government came up with $900 million to basically pay for the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. And the native peoples uh, we owned the entire state then. We owned all 380 million acres. At the end of the day, we ended up only preserving 11% in native ownership. So 44 million acres was retained out of 380 million. So our lives have always been under attack. We've always uh, had to adjust to politics and, and destruction around us. And so I just decided after the oil spill that I'd had enough, that it was the day to me that the ocean had died, but yet something inside of me came to life. And I realized that I needed to be louder than everything else, but yet remain a voice of reason so people would listen. And so I said, let's take on all the powers that be, bring them on. The uh, most of the restoration uh, since the oil spill uh, has been in the form of, of preserving equivalent habitat uh, to the best of our abilities. And what I mean by that is there was no way, once the oil hit the water, the war was over, we lost. There was no way to clean it up. Uh, you know, the number one uh, response to oil spills today is dispersants. <clears throat> dump it on the oil, sink it into the water column, get it out of the public view uh, and call it good and get ready for lawsuits. Um, the best thing and the only thing that we could have done was to try and save as much equivalent pristine habitat so the 27 most heavily impacted species had somewhere to call home and somewhere to recover. And that was, uh, you know, saving, uh, over a million acres of habitat in the spill zone that was scheduled to be clear cut. And then uh, about 400 million was spent on science that basically showed that oil and water don't mix. And I felt like, you know, if we're gonna have any chance of, of restoration that we had to do a number of things. We had to stab off the development uh, in the, the enclave of, of developers that wanted to clear cut, strip mine, oil drill, uh, you know, build ports. Uh, right now in the Copper River Delta, we're still facing the road across the Delta. There's still plans of mining the Bering River coal field. 
the military through the Air Force and the Navy are still bombing the Gulf of Alaska in their training programs. This year, they start May 3rd to May 14th. Our Copper River fishery opens on May 18th. In the last three years, uh, to give you some idea, uh, on an average normal run, we would have one to two million sockeye salmon, red salmon, return of the Copper River Delta annually. Three years ago, only 44,000 sockeyes came home. The year after that, uh, the ocean heated up to 76 degrees down the 20 feet below the surface, killing literally millions of krill, mussels, uh, wild kelp forests, uh, salmon and birds. Last year, only 85,000 sockeyes came home. And so whatever form of restoration that we can do uh, is, is needed and necessary right now. Uh, going back to the Copper River Delta, you know, there's plans to start mining uh, underneath the glaciers as they're receding because of climate change. In Alaska, uh, our sea ice, our permafrost, and our glaciers are melting at unprecedented rates because we are colder than other states and other regions. Uh, there's still plans by the Alaska Mental Health Trust to mine 30 to 45 miles of our beaches right down to the waterline to take the minerals out. And so, you know, anything that we can do uh, to stop these development projects and figure out how we're going to preserve what's left is critical because the only way that you're going to have restoration of any kind, whether it's language preservation, wild salmon habitat uh, uh, restoration, uh, is preserve what you already have, protect what you still have that's intact, still wild, still pristine, still roadless. And so that is our goal uh, on the Copper River Delta is to preserve everything that we possibly can. And by purchasing uh, the last 11,000 acres of the Bering River coal field on the Eastern Delta uh, will lead to the preservation of over 3 million acres of habitat that will remain roadless. Three years ago in 2016, our EAC Preservation Council and Native Conservancy uh, preserved 85% of the coal fields uh, where a conservation easement uh, will be in perpetuity on that other 85% of coal. And so we, we just have to, you know, as a human race, uh, we, we have to do things differently. We must all rise on the same tide. We have to figure out how we're going to make a difference in the world. And what it comes down to is we are the ones who need to make that difference. And so when I think about the work going forward on what we need to do, uh, we're gonna do cultural GIS mapping. We're looking at, uh, you know, figuring out how we can take our traditional place names and bring them back to life. Uh, that'll lead to recognition, it'll lead to uh, land claims, it'll lead to permanent protection of habitat. Uh, we want to figure out how we can restore the ocean, like one of the most uh, heavily impacted species that is on the endangered species list right now, besides the marble murrelet, the pigeon guillemot, and the AT1 res resident killer whale pod, is the Pacific herring. We once had 200,000 ton of herring returning to Prince William Sound annually. It used to be 50% of our annual income from that fishery alone. And that collapsed after the Exxon spill. It went down as low as 4,000 ton returning. And now last year and this year, uh, last year was about 18,000 ton came back. Uh, hopefully 20,000 or more will come back this year. But what it comes down to is what age class is coming back and, and you know, are they able to spawn? And what we've been finding from visual and, and I have friends out on the water right now, there is a lot of spawn uh, that they're seeing visually from the air and in the water, which is a good thing. But here's the thing, they have a, a disease that they had taken on after the spill and it's, it's killing them. You have, uh, lacerations and lesions uh, that are 
impacting these herring. And, and if, if the herring recover, uh, the 27 most heavily impacted species from the spill will recover. The people will recover. And, and the herring right now, what we're thinking is if we can grow restorative kelp forests in, in the water through our kelp farming, that it'll be uh, about regeneration. It'll be about uh, preserving the habitat and talking with other indigenous peoples. There's 21 tribes now that are interested in uh, kelp and mariculture farming. Uh, they are interested for three reasons. They want to restore the ocean. They want to be able to feed their people a traditional food source because we've been uh, enjoying uh, uh, kelp, harvesting kelp and herring row on kelp for over 2000 years as indigenous peoples along the coast. And the third is that they want to form a regenerative economy. And what's wonderful about that is a dear friend of ours from Alaska Conservation Foundation, uh, Michael Barber said, what you're doing here doing is you're starting a regenerative economy based on conservation, restoration and mitigation, not extraction. That'll be a first in Alaska's history. And so I feel like we're on the right track. We just have to figure out how to keep the coal in the ground and get more kelp in the water. What, one of the things uh, about kelp that people need to understand is kelp can sequester carbon five to 20 times more than actual living terrestrial forests. And bivalves, uh, which are mariculture, uh, which is, um, you know, mussels, clams, scallops, oysters, they can filter upwards of 40 to 60 gallons each per day. And this is a, a resource as a commercial fisherman, I fished my whole life. And when I go out to sea, I'm actually, uh, I have to think like a fish. I have to figure out how I'm going to, uh, you know, be able to chase this fish around and, and chase it down and, and figure out how to catch it. Where with kelp, uh, you don't have to feed it. You don't have to water it. You don't have to fertilize it. Uh, you don't have to chase it around. Uh, you just grow it. And if you're able to grow it in volume, uh, then you'll be able to, uh, you know, figure out how to uh, get more carbon sequestration. And, and here's the thing, we need to come up with community driven solutions that actually create green jobs, in our case, blue jobs, uh, and, and figure out how we're going to uh, start a new relationship with our traditional food sources. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, most people, especially in cities, uh, like right now, I'm, I'm here in San Francisco, uh, you know, doing some fundraising and working with our ED, uh, our, our, excuse me, our vice president, uh, Evelyn, and I subsist in the grocery stores. You know, you, you have a different way of life here in America where in Alaska, we're still able to live from the land and the sea. And because of climate change, because of what's happening to our lands and oceans, uh, we're gonna have to figure out how we're going to be able to grow our own food sources, whether it's on the land or in the ocean. Uh, we need to figure out how we're going to process our own food. Uh, we're gonna have to figure out how to <clears throat> value add those resources and, and be able to sell those products direct. And I remember about 15 years ago, I was reading this one article about the future of the internet and future of, of uh, the world. And, and it, at one point, this one uh, person said something to the effect of, well, you know, the people who are going to survive in this new world order, because it, we're going to have less are the ones who network, who have social networks. Uh, you know, we're going to have to be able to have our own uh, pods and, and, and groups that we huddle with, that we're able to network with and share food and stories and energy and, and, and be able to direct energy, time, money, and love, whatever direction that we need to. But it has to be with a 
network of people. And so I realized, you know, I needed to uh, figure out how Facebook worked and figure out how to get on LinkedIn. You know, I, I figured I, I had to uh, figure this out, how I was going to be able to communicate with people. Because for us right now, uh, it really comes down to uh, creating food sovereignty and food security programs that are based on being regenerative. Because if it's not regenerative, just don't do it. We need to uh, figure out how we're going to uh, grow a food source that can help take care of our people and, and take care of our planet. And so I'm really excited about kelp um, and, and mariculture because I feel like uh, with ocean acidification, uh, with the blob, which is the warming of the ocean like we had a couple years ago, uh, and with ocean rise, there's 31 villages that have to be relocated in Alaska right now today. There's 125 villages behind them that are going to have to be relocated. And so, uh, you know, we have to, you know, figure this out real quickly. Uh, you know, how are we going to feed our people? How are we going to take care of ourselves? How are we going to, you know, live from the land and the sea in the future? And so that means, you know, uh, thinking smarter, being smarter, acting smarter. Uh, and it could be as simple as uh, you get better long-term loans to build homes that are on stilts or uh, that are on barges. You know, so when the incoming tide comes in, you're able to float away to higher ground. Or if you're going to build houses, you know, on wheels, you can just hook it up to a, a truck and drive it to higher ground. And so uh, then what happens is you get better interest rates because you're building smart buildings. You're building, you know, getting ready for climate change and, and these uh, catastrophes that are going to happen over and over. And, and here's the thing. Collectively, we have the intelligence. We're smart enough to figure this out. Uh, but, you know, when we build resiliency, uh, like, for example, the uh, my people in Prince William Sound, in 1964, on Good Friday, uh, March 27th, uh, we had the 9.4 uh, Good Friday earthquake that rocked our world and rocked our fisheries and 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 it took 25 years for those fish to start coming back for us to start making a, a better living in the sea again. And then on the 25th anniversary of the good Friday quake, <clears throat> we had the Exxon Valdez oil spill happen in the same region in our backyard in Prince William sound. So again, our world was rocked again, our way of life changed. But then the, after 25 years, the ocean started recovering, the fishery started coming back, our crustaceans made a recovery, our king crab were coming back, our, our uh, spotted shrimp, uh, our, our dungeon nest, our tanner crab uh, started to rebound. And then 25 years later, we have climate change. So, you know, we have to evolve, we have to adapt, we have to be resilient, but we also have to be smarter. And, and we're capable, but do we have the courage to do it now? That's the question. When I first started out uh, saving habitat and, uh, you know, we, we can't uh, believe that we know everything and we can't, uh, you know, rely on our current leaders because they clearly have lost their wisdom on so many levels. And so I realized that I was going into this space of conservation, of habitat restoration, uh, of being a, an activist. And so uh, I didn't quite know how to do that. You know, I found one book at the time, The Monkey Wrench Gang, uh, you know, about d uh, direct action. Uh, there weren't a lot of books out there that, that could help people like me that wanted to defend my homelands from all the powers that be, including, you know, our own people, native corporations that wanted to clear cut the parallel path of the Exxon Valdez. And so I went down to Eak Lake 
and uh, it was uh, in September. It was uh, uh, cold. It was uh, foggy. It was drizzly. It was raining that evening. And uh, I went down because I knew the next day I was going to go uh, and speak to the highest levels of ocean government, the Exxon Valdez Wolfsville Trustee Council, and give my first presentation. And so I decided to go down uh, to the lake and, and talk to my ancestors. And I got down there and uh, it was starting to rain harder and, and I was getting more frustrated because I needed to see some sign. I needed to understand, uh, am I on the right path? Am I doing the right thing? Uh, do I have the wisdom and the courage to step up and be heard? And after about an hour of venting, high in the sky, the clouds started to part. And as the clouds st started to part, I saw Eak Mountain, this pyramid in the background, the silhouette of it. And I was like, okay, this is getting better. And then uh, the Northern Lights, this beautiful chartreuse green started dancing behind the uh, Eak Mountain. And, and, and I realized that it was just transcending and then the green from the Northern Lights filled this cloud, this circle, and it was a green halo in the sky. And to me, I was asking, I was just venting just right before that, I need to see a green arrow in the sky. I need to know that I'm on the right path and I need to see it now. And so then as this halo filled up with this chartreuse, translucent green it shot down to the water and it came across in shimmers across to me and i was like oh my god this is stunning and at that time silver salmon started jumping five six seven at a time right in front of me and and i was watching these ripples in the water and the splash and i could hear them and then all of a sudden an eagle flew over the top of my head and shrieked and I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And I looked up into the sky and I said, now that I have your attention. And I went off for another hour and I said, this is the deal. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. And I don't know what I'm gonna say. And I'm gonna go in there with a blank piece of paper. And if you have anything that you want to share in the history of time, anything that you've ever felt or wanted to say, then use me as a conduit, use me as a voice to speak through and I will deliver your message because I'm going in with a blank piece of paper and it's all you. And then I went, um, you know, I flew uh, first thing in the morning on, on the 7 a.m. flight, I flew up to Anchorage and uh, I get into the room and my sister Pamela's with me and we go up and we sit down and and um, she says, you know, is, is that your speech in front of you? I said, it is. I said, but don't let them see it. And she goes, okay. So she lifts it up and she sees it's blank on both sides. And she said, Dune, I think you brought the wrong presentation. And I said, no, um, actually the ancestors are gonna show up today, Pamela. And uh, they're gonna speak through me. And so it's, it's all on them this morning. And she was just terrified. And I said, we're gonna be okay. And her hands and my hands started, you know, getting a little slippery, we were worried. And I could feel, a, 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 you know, my face starting to, you know, get a little bit hot, you know, I was like, okay, well, are they gonna show up or what? And um, then the highest levels of government, you know, pile into the room and all their attorneys and, 30, 40 people, you know, uh, get up in front of us and I'm the first one to speak and I'm sitting there in the booth and waiting. And, and uh, so then I just start speaking and um, you're only allowed three minutes. Well, the next three people behind me gave me their three minutes and they said, we uh, will let Mr. Lankard speak in our behalf as well. And so I was able to get 12 minutes and I got a standing ovation 
And uh, I went to the back of the room and, and the, one of the lead attorneys came back and she said, you know, we'd uh, really like a copy of your presentation for the public record. And I handed her this blank piece of paper and she said, it, this is it. And I said, it is. And she said, well, that was one of the most amazing presentations I've ever heard. And I would liken that to when Chief Seattle lost his land. And I said, you know, I'm gonna take that as a compliment. And I realized that at that point that we just have to ask our ancestors for help, that we just have to have the belief that we don't know at all and understand that it's okay to ask for help and guidance during these times. And the ancestors will come to us. They will share their knowledge. They will share their words and their history. And Pamela, when we ended that meeting, she said, Dune, there was standing room only for the thousand plus EACs uh, that were ever uh, living on the Copper River Delta. All thousand of them were in this room today, standing room only, cheering you on. And so I realized that at that point, I can do this. You know, I just, I just have to uh, believe uh, that when we ask, our, our prayers will be answered. And so we have to be the ones who imagine the world that we want to live in and visualize that and then manifest it because it really does come down to us because we're the best we got. And we have to go forward and we have to move quickly and we have to show up. We have to take action. I think that uh, if we can, you know, find the courage to uh, say the right prayers and, uh, and everybody has their way, uh, you know, for me, I, I write them down and, and then I have a burning ceremony and I, I get my, uh, my dreams and my prayers and my vision out there into the universe. And then uh, as individuals, <clears throat> we have to then prepare. Uh, uh, and what I mean by that is, is number one, we have to believe that uh, we deserve help that we deserve for our prayers to come true and that we're worthy. So, so we, we have to believe in our vision and our mission. Um, and then the second thing that you have to do is you have to prepare to receive that dream or that prayer. Uh, because when it's answered, uh, that's when the work begins. Uh, because uh, when, when I think about, um, you know, my life and my work and, and uh, uh, inspiring others to take action is that, uh, you know, I remember who I am. I remember where I am. Uh, I remember what I have to do. And it usually starts with what I have in my hand. And in my hand, I usually have these Copper River stones uh, everywhere I go. Uh, we've rafted the Copper River, you know, probably 75 times or more. And there are some of the most magical sacred stones uh, anywhere on the planet. And so I gather them and I give them away to different people in my networks. And um, but I always have one in my pocket. So when I get scared or I get nervous or I wonder, you know, like, what am I going to say? And who's going to listen and uh, I'll have this uh, stone uh, in my pocket and I'll grab it and then I'll remember exactly who I am and where I'm from and what I have to say, what I need to share, what you need to hear. And, you know, and it's like when I think about, uh, you know, the future and how we're going to feed ourselves, uh, we're not going to be able to eat money. And so, people are going to have to figure out how they're going to grow their food sources. And I remember um, a dear friend, Dr. Elizabeth Hoover, uh, when I had gone to hear her speak several years ago, and she's helping on our food sovereignty program and getting the kelp in the water. She said to me that she'd written this article, and it was titled something like, how can you call yourself sovereign 
if you can't feed yourself. And I was like, oh my God, you know, this is absolutely true is, is we are going to have to figure out how to feed ourselves. And then shortly after that, one of our board members, Winona LaDuke had come to Alaska and had given a whole presentation on her food systems approach and her food security program. And, and, and that's what we need to do. We need to figure out how we can uh, uh, process and, and value add and, and take care of our food, grow it ourselves, process it, be able to uh, feed our people ourselves. And, and so uh, we're gonna you know, have to design portable and affordable uh, processing spaces, whether it's for freezing, for uh, community kitchens, for uh, kelp seed nurseries, whatever it is, we're gonna have to uh, scale up by scaling down. We're gonna have to think about, um, you know, how we're going to be able to take care of our families and take care of our villages and take care of our people on a smaller scale. Because at the end of the day, there's gonna be less and there's gonna be more chaos. But we just need to remember that the Chinese symbol for change is when chaos and opportunity are coming together. And we also have to remember that we are the outliers. We are the ones who are going to make that difference. And if we're going to survive as a human race, then we have to believe in, in something more that's in our minds. We have to believe in the creator. We have to believe in this ancient wisdom. We have to think about uh, being resilient being regenerative and being restorative every single moment of our life. I, I guess, you know, my, my closing thoughts are that, you know, we as a uh, human race are gonna perish if we stay on the path that we're on. And, you know, where if we, uh, you know, take our collective wisdom and knowledge and, and expertise in all these areas uh, that are presenting themselves around the world that are about, you know, bringing renewable energy uh, into our life because, you know, as, as important as food is, uh, so is how we're going to create these new energy systems. Uh, and, and the models do exist. Uh, nobody's figured out how to stop the sun from coming out every day. Nobody's figured out how to stop the wind from blowing. Nobody has figured out how to stop the tides from rising and falling. And so we can use all of that energy that's natural uh, to power this dream and these visions that we have for this new world order. Uh, because if we're going to survive, uh, we're going to have to go back in time. And we're going to have to fast forward and think about the seven generations behind us and the seventh generations in front of us, because they're the ones who are going to inherit the bad decision debt that we, we make today. They're the ones who are going to uh, inherit uh, the world that we leave them. And I have a 10 year old daughter, Ananda, who I think about every day. And I think about what I'm going to leave her. And I just apologize every day. I said, honey, I am so sorry that we are leaving this world to you, but I'm going to do everything in my power to leave you with choices, to leave you with some opportunity. Like my mother and father left me, like their parents left them. And the only way that that's going to happen is if we have the courage to stand up and face the powers that be and groom new leaders for these new times. And we're not talking about leaders that keep thinking that politics uh, can continue the way that they do. If we're going to survive, then we're going to have to demand that new leaders step up. And, and those may be the youth. Those may be the ones who uh, we groom. But we have to do this together and we can't do it alone. And so that means setting our political differences aside and figuring out a out as a human race, how we're going to survive going forward. Thank you. We will now learn from Indigenous Tagbanwa women on Kalawit Island in Busuanga, Palawan, Philippines. 
who are establishing a female-led sustainable oyster fishery to restore ecosystem health as they reclaim their ancestral land and waters. po namin ngayon na WMA ay nagmumula po ito sa iba't ibang grupo po rin po ng kapabayahan. At ito naman po yung pinakamin po na talagang purpose namin. Ito yung kachipay kung saan ito po yung imamanage namin. Sa kasulukuyan po ito na po yung aming minomonitor dahil ito po yung nanganganib na dahil sa sobra pong dami nangunguhan. Una-una po nabigyan kami ng uh, dalawang makina upang gagamitin sa pagpanahe po ng Christmas. So ito po yung panimula naming negosyo upang uh, masustinahan namin ang pangangailangan po namin at sa aming pamilya. Kumita rin po ang asosasyon ng umabot po ng 28,000. Nagkakaroon po rin kami ng community savings. kababayan na yung kalalakihan pala ay kaya naming pantayan sa pagmamadis po ng karagatan. Our next speaker will be Emily Cadiz. Emily is the program director of Hui Maka Ainana o Makana, a community organization formed by descendants of Haena on the island of Kauai in Hawaii. They take a place-centered approach that weaves together the identity and culture of native Hawaiian communities to sustainably manage their near-shore fisheries. Their mission is dedicated to perpetuating and teaching the skills, knowledge, and practices of their kupuna, or ancestors, through the interpretation, restoration, care, and protection of the natural and cultural resources that are located within the Haena State Park. The group's sustainable marine management is complemented by a mosaic of other initiatives, supporting the conservation and sustainable use of agricultural areas, sacred sites, and the entire watershed in the face of climate change. Aloha kako, my name is Emily Cadiz. I am from the island of Oahu um, in Hawaii, but currently living on the island of Kauai, where I am currently the program director for Hui Makainana o Makana. Hui Makainana o Makana, nonprofit established in 1999 um, by families from that area who came together to restore their traditional lo'i. So within the island of Kauai, we are on the northwestern side um, in the district or what we call Moku of Halelea in the smaller um, land division, Ahupua'a or watershed of Haena. And even more specific, we are in the Ili or the smaller district where our lo'i or taro patches where we run our nonprofit, 
we are in Ke'e, and that is where we are located. So our nonprofit currently, um, it's about 15 acres that we are in a cure. It's called a curatorship agreement with the state of Hawaii. Um, our our lo'i, our area that we caretake, is within um, the Ha'ena State Park, and um, as I mentioned earlier, the nonprofit that's got, that we started or the family started over 20 years ago, um, the goal was to restore the lo'i or taro patches that their families used to farm. And it has a very unique history of land tenure, land transformation over time. Um, one that I wish I could get into, but would encourage you all to check out one of our books that one of our community members wrote about our organization. And I will post that information later. Um, that can give you more information about um, the really unique, like I said, the really unique story of how a uh, community came together to um, to restore the land that they all farmed, their families farmed generations ago. Um, so within that nonprofit that was started over 20 years ago, the family started to clear the overgrowth that has happened over years of, of um, the state park taking back that area, um, cleared all the hull bush, cleared all the area to find the old lo'i over there. And then um, within that area, once the families restored the taro patches, the family had always envisioned going back to traditional resource management and really looking what we say, Malka to Makai, which is from the mountains to the sea. Um, we have a really interesting um, area within Ha'ena where the a uh, very unique as well in that the community really has a voice in everything from the mountains to the sea. In our upper watershed we have Limahuli Gardens who is a National Tropical Botanical Gardens. They um, manage from the top of the watershed to, um, to the lower land of the watershed and then our organization um, like I said has a curatorship agreement with the state where we manage, um, co-manage and farm the taro patches. And then the families not too long ago really wanted to also look into the fisheries. So we're the first in the state of Hawaii um, in August of 2015 to be designated as a community-based subsistence fishing area, which basically allows our community to co-manage our nearshore fisheries about from the nearshore to about one mile out of the fisheries within the Ha'ena district where the families um, co-manage that with the state and have created rules and regulations that when anybody comes and fishes in Ha'ena, there are rules that are specific to fishing in Ha'ena due to cultural and traditional practices that still exist within Ha'ena today. The goal of our Ha'ena community-based subsistence fishing area, end quote, was to sustainably support the consumptive needs of the Ha'ena people through culturally rooted community-based management that recognizes and responds to the connection between land and sea and strives to restore the necessary balance of our native species. And that was our proposed management plan for Ha'ena back in 2011. And so on August 4th, 2015 was when our CBSFA or Community Based Subsistence Fishing Area was um, signed by our governor to um, as the first state, as the first community to receive this CBSFA designation to reaffirm and protect fishing practices customarily and traditionally exercised for the purposes of Native Hawaiian subsistence, culture, and, relig and religion. And this is in our um, Hawaii revised statutes. So it's now in law for us. So those are that's kind of what happened in the 2000s to build towards um, getting our community-based subsistence fishing area designation. So in the in the process of creating the CBSFA, I really stepped in towards the very end, if not when the community got designated. But um, just from hearing about it, that we have professors that documented this process due to it being the first community in the state to go through this and the first time the state of Hawaii has ever had a designation like this before. So there's much better information out there documenting um, that whole process. Um, just know that it was over 20 years in the making, a um, lot of on the ground work. Um, it, we would have never gotten it without the leadership of our organization who are all doing this within their free time, volunteering. This was not a paid position to have these gatherings 
we're talking door to door, talking to all the families from down there to get everybody on the same page. Real beautiful in just building community, um, cohesiveness and capacity, a really unreal process of the people, boots on the ground, the families from down there coming together to create um, the best management that they think that they could create for their place. Um, so yeah, lots of meetings, lots of meetings back and forth with the state, um, negotiating rules, um, coming to the same page. Another big piece of this process that I remember when I say the uncles, these are like the leaders in our community, I call them the uncles. Um, they had to consult with, because the ocean is a public resource, they had to reach out to all the different stakeholders within the Haena community that utilize the ocean as a resource. So I remember the uncles sharing, they had to consult with the scuba operation, the scuba diving operations. They had to consult with the kite surfers, the surfers, um, those that use the ocean for recreational purposes and subsistence purposes and commercial purposes. And, um, this was not something that I would say per se the community had to do, but definitely a value that our leaders in our community felt was necessary. And as I said, that is why I believe that our organization was so successful in being the first in the state to get this designation or just successful in general to get this designation is because they took the time and consideration and that one-on-one, -on -one, in person, um, really um, driving this as a collective. And one of my favorite quotes is, um, it's an African proverb, you can either go fast and go alone, or you can go far and go together. And that is really a motto of our organization, I feel, is that um, there's a lot of groundwork that has to happen all day, every day with a lot of decisions that are made in Haena. Some that try to get speed up and, and happen faster than we can grasp. But something I appreciate about our organization is our organization and our leaders have always remained in the driver's seat for decisions that are made for our place. And um, and they take the time, like I said, the boots on the ground work to make sure that as they're driving these things, everybody's coming along and moving forward together. And it's um, because to us, when you move forward together and you look back, you want to still make sure everybody's still there. And if you look back and nobody's there anymore, is that really successful in community building and in, in any community um, in any community um, decisions, in any community work in general, it should be the collective. Um, defining community is a very hard thing. Um, we still navigate what that is, um, but that's how we operate is as a community. Um, some little updates about how it's going now. Um, since 2015, we're obviously for five years since the designation. Um, due to COVID, we've um, had to do a lot of virtual presentations, but um, after getting the designation, um, there's a five-year review that happens. And so that was back in 2020, this past year. Um, we we're supposed to hold a big event or we wanted to hold a big event to give everybody update on um, our research, we have a lot of partnerships with the universities, with a lot of um, other organizations that are skilled in research and helping us gather data. It's a very collective process, not only on the co-management side is it a collective process, but even with our research and monitoring, it's a very collective process. We have, we understand that as a community, we can't be doing all the data collection and all, and all of that to report to the state. This is really something, if any community wants to go through this process, you need the collective, you need the partnerships, you need it all, which is a huge undertaking. Um, and so we just had a five-year review. Um, our biomass has increased in our fisheries. We have a lot of um, results that is on our website that's public information for everybody to look up and know. Um, but yeah, a lot of um, a lot of monitoring results from our fisheries to our limu or our our algae to our urchins. We have a pretty collective, comprehensive report. And then, um, but to me, most importantly, what our organization is tracking is kind of the other really important stuff, which I think is the more important stuff, which is transfer of intergenerational knowledge um, involving our youth and lineal descendants. Um, huge increase in subsistence fishing, both from April 2018, we had the huge floods, which closed off a whole section of the road and nobody could access that part of the island unless by boat. So we noticed an increase of subsistence fishing. 
um, with the families down there because of that. Um, even with COVID and people not wanting to go to stores anymore and just trying to stay at home. Um, so those are those have been huge reminders in when we gave a five year report or review of this is why we do what we do because this is what's happening. This is this is the things that are that that's happening and and if communities aren't on it and taking care of their places and setting up their their places for six for these for these things that we don't even know to come. This is kind of that generational thinking that that um that our organization that our kupuna our ancestors from that place were thinking about ahead before these things ever happened i mean i have uncle well i can't point right there uncle tommy hashimoto is one of the um one of the big kupuna from our organization who passed away a couple years ago but these are him anti vi many other many many other kupuna that i can't name all of them this was their vision to create subsistence and perpetuate subsistence in their community. And um, so our five-year report was really um, trying to capture a little bit of that. We're still working on a physical report to send. Um, another cool thing that I'd like to share is that I work with a lot of our youth and we have a lot of youth from our community, from fifth graders to high schoolers that help us with our monitoring program, our data collection and our data analysis and even going to be helping with our reporting. And so those are the things that our community and organization care about. For what are we doing these things if we're not involving the next generation and they're not involved in the steps and the process of co-management, of community-based research, of learning collab the importance of col good collaboration, good partnerships, and all of that kind of stuff. So as I mentioned earlier, the American, uh, sorry, as I mentioned earlier, that African proverb of to go fast and go alone or to go together and travel farther, um, that's definitely something that I've noticed that this organization values and lives by. Another one that I'd just like to leave everybody with is, of course, it has to be a Hawaiian proverb now coming from Hawaii. Um, and I'm going to read it to you guys real quick. He la vai ano ke kai papau he pokole ke aho he la vai ano ke kai hohonu he loa ke aho, which means, a fisherman of shallow seas uses only a short line, a fisherman of the deep sea uses a long line, which also means you will reach only as far as you aim. So similar to the African proverb, um, from a fishing perspective, from a fishing community, it's very fitting for us, but. You only go as far, um, as far as as far and as deep as you're as you're willing to go. Um, catching things in the shallow versus catching things in the deep, and that has nothing to do with the difference of fishing capabilities. It's just a metaphor for how deep are you willing to go, how deep are you willing to invest, um, and that is another value and another thing that I've recognized is very important to this organization. Um, if you just, and this would also be my piece of advice for other communities. If you choose to just dive in the shallows, just to grab what what's what you can see, what's at reach, um, and kind of just get things quickly, that's a whole different experience, and you'll get a whole different result than taking the necessary time, preparation to travel to the deep and to dig down to the deep and to the depths. Um, and that has kind of been a model, I think, in general for our life work. Um, with this organization and with other community organizations, I work, for example, our Nakiloina program, which is all of our education programs and what we teach. Um, something that we're really learning in, in not just fisheries in general, but in management in general, is that people only grab and, and attach issues in conservation and management to the things that they can just see right away. Like, Oh, there's no more fish in the ocean. It's because of overfishing. Oh, there's no more this happening. This management system is failing. Oh, it's just because of this, this, and this. And they're just looking at the shallow of what they can see or what, and jumping to really quick conclusions about what they think is happening. One of the biggest lessons that we've learned and what we teach is you need to let a place tell you, and you need to, you need to let the people of the place tell you, um, and you need to listen to the place. Um, so for us with the overfishing and those things, it's actually not that. It's a compounding of many things that are happening from 
fishing to um, the wrong, or we don't have the correct management systems in place, bag limits and size limits that are not that are not supporting productivity of our fisheries. Um, we have development issues. We have erosion issues. We have, like I said, back to the very beginning, that Malka to Makai connection. You cannot just jump and look one-sided at, at the issues of what's happening in a fisheries. You need to look at what's happening from the top to the to to the bottom and the bottom to the top and vice versa. Top to bottom, bottom to top. Um, and so to me, just pulling it back to that quote, that's the most important thing because those take more time to to find out. Those take more, um, uh, they take longer. Um, one thing I goof around about, but it's very serious, is it's a lot of this work is for communities. It's our life's work. But when you talk to researchers or other organizations or state agencies, these things are within funding sort funding periods. So they can only clock in and clock out within those segments of time. But you have to understand you're working with communities who not only know these resources for generations, but are continuing to gonna take care and manage these things for generations, whether there's money coming in, whether there's research coming in or not. This is this is people's life. This is people's livelihood. And so that's why organizations like ours take the time to go out to the depths of the ocean to to invest and to do the the steps that it takes to address things and to look at a collective picture rather than just scratching the surface and grabbing things that that you only see in your reach and what we're finding is that's actually more damaging is those that do that and just pick, pick what they're seeing versus those that invest the time, the space, um, and and go go through the process of of bringing the collective and moving as a collective. So I guess just closing thoughts is invest in your people, invest in your places, um, invest in the next generation. Take the time to to go deeper, explore more, reach reach a broader reach. If you guys have any questions or want to know more about our organization, um, you can find you can follow us at Hui Maka Ainano Makana on our in, we have an Instagram, we have a Facebook, and we have a website Hui Maka Ainano Makana dot org. Um, yeah, just more information about us and thank you, Mahalo for listening to a little bit of our story and. I hope something you heard today resonates with you or you took away something that um, is either similar or could come back into the work that you do or the life that you live. Mahalo. The following remarks are from a fellow Peruvian, Marina Testino, a creative director and artivist of Indigenous Peruvian heritage, an artivist being somebody that combines their art with activism. Marina's work drives behavior change and responsible consumption to protect planetary and specifically ocean health. She is active in addressing plastic pollution and advocating for sustainability within the fashion industry, the fashion industry being one of the major global polluters. Hi, my name is Marina Testino and I focus my career on merging arts, sustainability and innovation through creative direction, content creation, um, fashion design, marketing, and artivism. My dad is Peruvian and he's been going to his beach town, Punta Hermosa, all his life. And I've been going, going there every year, once or twice a year. And I remember the difference from when I started going till now. Like, we would see dolphins every day. We would be able to go to the fish market and have fresh fish, see the fishermen coming back from, from their day fishing. And recently it's filled with plastic. You, we found a penguin the other day. Um, you don't see any uh, dolphins anymore. Um, it's, it's so sad to see the change in all these different oceans around the world because we are not treating them, not respecting them and using them as a huge garbage can.
My name means from the sea and I've always felt very connected to the ocean and lived around the ocean, grew up around it. And I wanted to, to give back and, and raise awareness around the problems with plastic pollution. So I started a campaign called We See Through and it was to um, discover the naked truth around plastic pollution in our oceans. Um, I wanted to tackle how plastic pollution gets into our oceans and what we can do to avoid it. So I looked into to all the different things that, that plastic pollution uh, affects and it really is at all the choices we make, what we eat, what we buy, what we wear, what we consume, everything we decide, every decision we make can contribute to plastic pollution. And I wanted to investigate, okay, so what are the products, what are the beauty products we should, we should use? What are, how can we consume without single-use plastic? How, what clothes should we be buying? Um, what products should we be sharing with, cleaning um, our, our house? Because everything ends up in the ocean. And if we don't start by knowing what the problem is, we can't find solutions to it. Um, so this was an investigation of the different areas of our life and how uh, plastic affects it and how we can reduce it by just choosing differently. Um, what we're consuming. Thanks for listening and I hope you learned something <laughs> from this panel and, and just in general from all the speakers today because it's so important to, to protect our oceans and raise awareness around the dangers that they're facing. So please share the information you learn with your friends, with your family, because at the end of the day, the only people that can do something about it is us. And if we don't act, um, we will keep going the way we are and we can't. <laughs> My name is Nina Gualinga and I am from the Quechua people of Sarayaku in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, I'm currently in Southern Sweden and um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the Sami people living in northern Sweden. Um, they too have been fighting to protect their territories and ways of life, um, just as my community in the Amazon. Um, and indigenous people all around the world um, have been fighting to protect their territories, land, water, and life on earth. Um, and because of this, because we have been standing up against big corporations and extractive industries uh, that are destroying our territories and ways of life, um, many indigenous people and leaders have been threatened, persecuted, tortured, raped, and murdered. Um, but we have known for many generations that we must protect and take care of um, our earth because we depend on what nature gives us. And my people, um, we believe that the forest is alive, that the earth is alive. We call it Kausaksacha, which means the living forest. And the trees are alive, the animals are alive, the mountains, the lakes, the rivers. And we are, as a community and as humans, we are part of, of, of this living organism, which is the earth. And um, even if I didn't grow up by the ocean, the rivers that I have bathed in my whole life eventually lead to the ocean. And the rivers are alive. 
the water is alive, the ocean is alive, um, and everything that is in it. Um, and in order to halt the destruction and create balance again, um, we need to listen to indigenous voices and indigenous knowledge because we have been taking care of the, these places for many generations and that has been proven. We know that the best protected areas are indigenous territories. That's a fact. Um, but there is also one important aspect in all of this is that when we talk about listening to indigenous people and um, using indigenous knowledge uh, to protect the earth and to protect life on earth, we, need, we also need to be aware of um, that we need to work with indigenous people and make sure that indigenous people take the lead and guide us because if we don't do that, this will just be another story of extraction of indigenous knowledge, indigenous territories, indigenous medicine, and indigenous healing. Um, and that is exactly what has been happening um, from the first era of colonization where indigenous land and indigenous knowledge is being extracted for various reasons. And today we talk a lot about indigenous, indigenous wisdom, indigenous knowledge, um, but we also need to be really careful in how, how we work with indigenous people. And are we extracting the knowledge that indigenous people carry, or are we actually making sure that indigenous people have a role in this, that indigenous people are taking the lead and guiding us? Because that, that is the work that needs to be done. That is the real work that needs to be done. Um, and also shift our, our mindsets um, in how we view and how we relate to the living beings around us. Um, because essentially that is the connection, that special connection that indigenous people have with the earth is that we recognize ourselves as part of nature. There is no other. Nature is, is not, um, we are part of nature. And you, we can often see that, for example, in, in the Quechua language, there is no word such as nature. And that is because we don't view nature as the other or something that is outside of our societies but we are rather included in that. Even, I mean, if we look at what's happening in the Amazon right now, you know, there is a certain tree, the balsa tree that is being extracted so aggressively, um, that is being cut down, exported from the Amazon to China so that they can use um, this wood um, for the wind power engines. So, you know, we're, ex we're actually cutting down the Amazon um, in the name of green energy, wind power, and in the name of sustainability. I was saying it's really important to really work in collaboration with indigenous groups, indigenous people, and let you know, it let indigenous people lead the way, really, um, because, you know, it's those indigenous people that know the land that, you know, have been, 
ha that have had this relationship with the land or the ocean or the rivers or the lakes or the mountains that know the best. So we need to trust their knowledge, their wisdom and their capacity, you know, and work work with indigenous people, not for. That will be that will be the answer to all our questions is to really truly let indigenous people lead the way in this. Our next address will be from John Milton, who has led a lifelong career as both an ecologist and spiritual teacher. He will speak on the beauty of finding resonance between those both spheres and recognizing the power of ancient knowledge and wisdom. Among his many accolades, John was one of the architects of the US National Environmental Policy Act, one of the founders with David Brower of Friends of the Earth, and served as the White House's first ecologist in 1972. Since the 1980s, John has been a master teacher of meditation, Tai Chi, and vision quest retreats. Most recently, he has focused on developing an earth-honoring, liberating set of principles and practices that merge the heart and mind openness of spiritual exploration with a scientific grounding in ecology. His passion is to help shift human spiritual systems towards an environmentally sustainable way of life, creating a new cultural foundation for the West that he refers to as sacred ecology. From this perspective emerges an earth-connected spirituality that recognizes all living beings as one's true community. My, uh, my background environmentally was being very much involved in the early 60s with uh, realizing that there wasn't, in those days we just really had a focus on conservation and natural resources. You didn't have the word environment being used very widely and things like regener regeneration and sustainability were not being used hardly at all. <clears throat> Hard to imagine in these days, but uh, when I began working in the early days with a group, a precursor to the World, World, World Wildlife Fund, um, one of the things I wanted to do is to help provide a basis for helping people see the natural world as a whole system that included so we had a more um, open view of nature as uh, a full global ecosystem of which we were a dynamic part so i began asking to go out into the nature as a young man uh, to spend time alone to really bond deeply and completely with nature experientially and um I remember I began trying to do that when I was around four, but uh, my my parents and grandparents uh, wouldn't let me do it th at that age. <laughs> so finally, when I reached the age of um, around seven years old, they said, okay, it's okay for you to go out alone. And I spent a short time, it was only four or five nights and days, a little less than a week of deep solitude in nature in a very primordial area in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And that was really my birthing into the experiential connection of being part of the whole system. So spiritually, I was birthed into this kind of connection through the vision quest process with the help of my grandparents and parents. Uh, my grandparents especially had maintained a, an indigenous perspective and uh, that was very helpful to me, um, I think in helping bring me into the, this vision experience. Then I began to, because of that experience of the whole system as a reality of humans relationship, true relationship to nature, um, not dominating nature, I mean, dominion over nature, but being a co-equal partner in the dance of life. Uh, from that, I began to become attracted to things like ecology and the and biology and the sciences of life and whole systems. So I went from that to eventually becoming uh, involved with the environmental movement birthing process. And I trained in ecosystem ecology at the University of Michigan, where it was one of the few places where they taught ecosystem types of um, analysis. So that was really... Uh, both on the experiential spiritual side and more of an indigenous perspective 
with the vision questing, which by the way, I maintain, I do at least one or two a year, every year from age uh, seven on. And that has continued to support me and deepen my own experience of the deep uh, spiritual truth of connectivity to the rest of life and the family of life. And I noticed that there are really three kinds of nature. The world of outer nature, which had been a great deal of my work and my concern, the world of ecology, <clears throat> the rest of the family of life that we've been talking about and establishing connections with that and all of the elements as well. But there's also the inner nature aspect, our emotions, our, our feelings, our perceptions, our sensations, and all the basic raw material of our experience of life and our experience of that connection with the outer world. So how to help people refine that experience of connection, initially through providing things like experience about tracking, how to meditate in nature, and take the tools from Taoism and Buddhism and indigenous peoples on how to refine the awareness so that through the senses of sight, sound, taste, smell, touch, balance and movement, and um, the flow of energy, we could learn how to go deeper and deeper into this experience of connection. But at the same time, I also realized there was a third level of nature too that was being ripened or opened by the by this uh, wave nature process. And that's the true nature aspect of being, which is the, the foundational level at which um, from which all nature and from which we ourselves arise. In most traditional cultures, that I, I guess the common word these days would be source. Uh, a field of pure, formless, open, vast, unborn, undying awareness and consciousness that lies as the foundation of being out of which all life arises, manifests, and ultimately dissolves back into this pure, um, unbounded wholeness of pure source of awareness that lies at the level of your true nature. So it's the outer nature level, the inner nature level, and the true nature level that we began to cultivate with the way of nature. If we're able to transform the blockages within ourselves so our energy is truly free of the, the main blockages of fear, anger, uh, ignorance, um, hastiness, uh, various kinds of attachments and aversions, worry, um, and all the things that tend to bind the energy, we can become much more effective and powerful warriors for the benefit of the rest of the planet and the rest of life. That means that if you're facing a novel situation environmentally as, a, as an environmental warrior, and you're struggling to find a way to work with the situation skillfully, if you can touch into the true nature level of your being, answers can arise to that situation which are completely novel and incredibly creative for that situation to bring about a resolution in the most profound and, and regenerative way. If you just come from the level of the normal ego-based mind, the creative responsiveness are, is far weaker, far less complete, and often far less uh, creative. And here's, here are some of the tools and the toolkit that provides this capacity to unfold within one's own heart as well as within one's own culture. A huge thank you to our brilliant presenters and storytellers from all around the world. It's now with great pleasure that I introduce Giselle Rael Darbel, who is a dear friend and colleague of mine. She's a flutist and vocalist. She's a captivating performing artist who infuses ritual and indigenous culture into the electronic scene. She's a classically trained musician who has been journeying in the music scene for over 10 years. Through her travels and love of ceremony, she's created a soundscape of unique conscious textures and fusion of tribal electronic medicine music, whilst curating an alchemic experience, honoring the elements and inspiring healing through the powerful use of indigenous chants and ancient mantras. In honor of her Afro-Caribbean heritage, she will be performing a song dedicated to the African goddess of the ocean, Yemanja.
As we close today, I'd like to thank everybody who joined us from around the world. It has truly been such a privilege to be able to hear from these communities and community leaders and really receive the direct transmission of their ancestral and ancient wisdom. One of the advantages of the modern world that we live in is that we no longer have to be isolated with this wisdom. We can come together in forums like today to share resources and strategies. And this kind of cross-cultural exchange is going to be vital in our work moving forward to protect and restore our ocean. In a way, the baton of this information and wisdom has been passed down onto us today. And it is our responsibility now to figure out what we will do with it. What will we do with this incredible information we have just received? And so I encourage you all to think about how to carry these conversations and this awareness with you into the work that you are doing, whether or not it is ocean related. I encourage you to continue to find ways to acknowledge the ancient wisdom of our elders and communities and to live in respect and harmony with others and the natural world that we are a part of. As I stated earlier, we are not separate from water. We and water are one. And today we have learned how we can live in a more harmonious and symbiotic relationship with this precious element, without which there would be no life on Earth. I look forward to continuing this exploration with you in the future to ensure a thriving and healthy world and ocean for the generations to come. <laughs>